Welcome to Teleforum, a podcast of the Federalist Society's practice groups. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel, and Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. For exclusive access to live recordings of practice group Teleforum calls, become a Federalist Society member today at fedsoc.org. Welcome to the Federalist Society's webinar call. Today, February 2nd, we discuss Cochrane v. SEC, vindicating Article III jurisdiction over the structural constitution in ALJs. My name is Guy DeSanctis, and I'm Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Gregory G. Garr, partner at Latham & Watkins and global chair of the firm's Supreme Court and Appellate Practice Group, and also Peggy Little, senior litigation counsel at New Civil Liberties Alliance. Peggy also argued Cochrane v. SEC. Throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please submit them through the question and answer feature or the chat so that our speakers will have access to them for when we get to that portion of the webinar. With that, thank you for being with us today. Gregory and Peggy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Guy. Cochran uh, was a long time in coming and was a cul culmination of a lot of work in district courts in California, in the Northern District of Connecticut, and also appellate work on behalf of NCLA in uh, three circuits. Uh, we were up against a very heavy climb. There were five circuits that held against us that there was no uh, district court jurisdiction to hear these Article II separation of powers claims. And by the time of oral argument before the uh, the Fifth Circuit, uh, yet another circuit had joined the Ninth Circuit, um, which had uh, also said there was no district court jurisdiction to hear these claims. Um, it was argued uh, on January 20th before 16 of the judges on the Fifth Circuit. NCLA's work on this began when we were asked to represent Ray Lucia on remand. And for those of you not familiar with the Lucia decision, I think it sets uh, a good background for what we'll be talking about today. Ray Lucia uh, went through six years of uh, proceedings, most a good deal of it, uh, two and a half years, I believe, at, in administrative proceedings. And then he brought challenges to the appointment of his administrative law judge. He took that all the way through. Um, uh, the D.C. Circuit, the D.C. Circuit, and then he sought en banc review there, and there was an even split, so the tie went to the government on that one. And then he did get um, cert, and at the U.S. Supreme Court, they held that his administrative law judge had not been constitutionally appointed. Both Ray Lucia and Michelle Cochran were in the situation that they were broke and on the receiving end of Pyrrhic victories. Because Ray Lucia's prize for taking that appointments claim all the way to the Supreme Court was that he got to go back and do it all over again. He uh, had to go through a whole brand new round of uh, administrative proceedings. And um, he still had a Article II claim in the case uh, on the removal question of the multiple layers of removal protections for SEC administrative law judges. Uh, and yet the Supreme Court had not granted cert on that aspect of his Article II claims. So he had to go back and try to raise those before an administrative law judge. We stepped in at a, a New Civil Liberties Alliance and represented Ray, who had no more money for legal fees at that point. And in fact, his business was ruined. Uh, by that, by that time, six years into these SEC charges. So we brought suit in San Diego District Court to say he should not have to go through that insane Kafka-esque process all over again. And it's important to realize that while this looks like um, a fairly logical and simple outcome that we'll, we will be discussing today. At the time, we had five circuits against us. We had this U.S. Supreme Court remanding the case to be reheard before an administrative law judge. And in both a briefing and many of the public accounts of the case, it was seen as basically a frivolous lawsuit, which is no fun to uh, 
be accused of and certainly no, no fun to try to bring into, into court. Um, there were several troubling things also. Both Ray and uh, Michelle had a particular administrative law judge, Cameron Elliott, who had um, told people who came before him that he always rules for the SEC. And in addition, that he always gives the maximum penalty to anyone who contests their charges. Uh, one of the interesting things about the original opinion in Lucia is that Justice Kagan called out that administrative law judge, and she ordered that um, Ray's same judge would not rehear his case. That is highly unusual for those of you who, who know that when whenever a case is remanded, whether it be to a district judge or to an administrative law judge, the court does not off order that it not be the same judge unless there's real cause for concern. And of course, this was one of the concerns um, in all of these things is that the administrative law judges are employed by the prosecutor. So there are due process and other fairness uh, concerns. But uh, the Supreme Court had at least uh, uh, ordered that there would be a new administrative uh, law judge. It's hard to overstate the absurdity of the position of the SEC and the five circuits that they were able to lob at us in the briefing. Um, no rational system of justice would be designed so that if you had an unconstitutional judge, you had to go through a full round of proceedings, proceedings that uh, take years uh, to, to resolve. And then you get to go into a circuit court and say, hey, you know, that administrative law judge was not constitutional. And it was also baffling to me why the five circuits even ruled as they did, because Free Enterprise Fund, which had been decided before any of those five circuit cases, had held that under the very same statute, the SEC, um, the Exchange Act, Section 78Y, that in fact, there was district court uh, jurisdiction to hear precisely this issue, which is removal protections. And so it was both uh, baffling and, and difficult to overcome these um, five circuit court opinions. I won't go into the details of the opinions, um, as you might imagine, having briefed it several times in San Diego at the Ninth Circuit, at the Northern District, uh, Texas, uh, through the Eleventh Circuit. We also sought um, review and Greg Garr uh, helped us with a uh, petition uh, for certiorari in that case. Uh, so we, we briefed those cases a great deal, but I will point out one of them if for those of you who would like to school yourself in how bad it can get. Uh, I would choose um, as the worst of those decisions, the Tilton versus SEC case in the Second Circuit. It was an early decision and it uh, it was very unsatisfactorily uh, reasoned in the in the majority opinion, and it was also the only circuit uh, court case that had a dissent. Uh, that is until the Ninth Circuit chimed in um, after after uh, on bond review was granted in uh, in Cochran. And the frustrating thing about the um, <laughs> the Tilton decision, and, and then we kept running up against the standard oil claim. I, I don't know if any of you have, uh, have run a, a, up against this, but one thing they love to say is that going through unconstitutional proceedings that may take years and ultimately be uh, reversed is, quote, part of the social burden of living under government. And that language uh, kept get, getting tossed at us left and right. The Tilton uh decision is particularly galling because there's a footnote in the opinion in which they cite learned hand acknowledging that becoming a party to a lawsuit should be dreaded beyond almost anything else short of sickness or death. <laughs> Nonetheless, the SEC, um, or rather the Second Circuit, seem not to care that uh, and, 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 and actually, all of the circuit decisions had an enormously callous view of what it would mean for ordinary Americans to go through a multi-year administrative law process that would ultimately make uh, no sense at all to have gone through in the first place. 
perhaps the most refreshing thing about the uh, Cochrane decision is it turned that ship around and actually looked hard at the question of what this would entail for the respondents who had been charged by the SEC. And uh, they actually recited Mr. Lucia's arduous journey through that process and noted that after eight years of fighting, he had to surrender his constitutional rights because he simply could not afford to fight any longer and had to settle. Um, the first hint that we would might get a break in the Fifth Circuit was when we had noticed that the court ordered a hearing on our motion for an injunction, staying the administrative proceedings pending appeal. And that was heard um, before Judges uh, Jones, Oldham and Higginson. And to our delight, <laughs> unanimously, they voted just a couple hours after the hearing to stay the administrative proceedings. And that was a sign that we um, you know, had a circuit that was at least willing to listen to these um, questions. Um, the panel that ultimately heard the merits of the jurisdictional uh, question did rule against uh, Michelle Cochran two to one. Um, and they did so largely citing uh, uh, an opinion called Bank of Louisiana, in which uh, a, under a different statutory scheme for the FDIC, an earlier panel of the uh, Fifth Circuit had ruled that you had to go through the administrative proceedings. Uh, the Bank of Louisiana case was quite distinguishable for any number of reasons, including that the FDIC statute, um, Section 1818, expressly stripped jurisdiction from the district courts and said that for these claims under the, the section of the FDIC statute, you had to just go through administrative proceedings. Whereas not only did we not have uh, a jurisdictional stripping section of the 34 Act, there in fact was a jurisdiction preserving section of the 34 Act that said nothing in this statute establishing administrative proceedings um, shall be construed to uh, remove jurisdiction for our remedies already available in the federal courts. So we had a structural statutory grounds and also a, an important distinction between the Bank of Louisiana case. Nonetheless, uh, we lost two to one. We felt that this was certainly an, a question of exceptional importance and so uh, sought en banc rehearing. Uh, we were delighted when the briefing by the SEC was ordered and ultimately we had a rehearing en banc. At the argument, I would say one of the things that was most interesting to me was uh, uh, the judges, they seemed to appreciate the fact that what the courts in the five circuits and actually six circuits by, by the time it was argued, what they were asking people to do was go through multiple years of uh, administrative proceedings uh, before they could ever find out if the judge that had heard those hearings was even constitutional. For Michelle Cochran, it was five years. For Ray Lucia, as the uh, Cochran decision notes, it was eight years. There was a Tenth Circuit case uh, involving a gentleman named David Bandamere. That was 10 years. George Jarkesy had seven years. Christopher Gibson, uh, in the case in which Greg uh, helped us petition for cert, had a four-year uh, journey, and that's still counting through the administrative proceedings. And um, if you contrast that to the normal time from filing to resolution in the federal courts, that uh, in the federal courts, it averages somewhere around two, two and a half years. So you're talking about uh, uh, multiple uh, multiples of the normal district court time to resolution of a case uh, if you go into administrative proceedings. This uh, focuses on what I like to call, uh, and I, I do so somewhat pejoratively, <laughs> what I like to call the big lie. Andrew Ceresny, who was um, enforcement director of the SEC, 
at one point did acknowledge that, yes, it's true, you do not have the same due process protections in administrative proceedings, but they are shorter, swifter, faster, and um, and offer a uh, sort of truncated but generally fair um, way of the SEC to prosecute people. And that is just not true in the case of these um uh, the is individuals that I have set forth. And in fact, I think uh, if someone were to do a study of how long these administrative proceedings take, uh, there would be um, some disturbing uh, data to, to come out of that. Uh, it's something I, I keep telling myself I should do, but I haven't had the chance to do yet. So when the SEC... Um, uh, charges you, you have to realize they've had years to investigate you. Now, they could charge you either in district court or in administrative proceedings. And they can bring those proceedings very swiftly and give you very little time to prepare a defense. And very often it's, it's as short as 60 or 90 days or sometimes 120 days for you to prepare your defense. And then they can sit on your case for multiple years. And that is um, just um, really a denial of, of litigants' rights to have their claims timely heard. Then when you consider the nature of their constitutional claim in all of these cases, is that the judge hearing those unbalanced and, uh, and inefficient uh, proceedings are not even constitutionally uh, permitted to hear them. It was very refreshing to see the court uh, look, uh, the the um, en banc circuit court take a fresh look at these questions. They not only um, looked at the logic of the uh, proceedings, and of course, if you're going to be putting your uh, your ability to defend yourself before an in-house judge, that judge should be constitutionally appointed. And that has that is a threshold question that must be decided. In the majority opinion, they also went through the logic and text of the statute, which was really the first time that someone had done that and, and went into the differences, for example, that there was a jurisdiction preserving provision in 78Y. They also essentially just uh, enforce free enterprise fund that was the great mystery to me all along is free enterprise fund held in 2010 that uh, there's district court jurisdiction for these kinds of administrative law claims. And um, it, for the life of me, I'll never understand why five circuits could, <laughs> could fail to uh, follow that Supreme Court uh, precedent. It does make you wonder if um, courts in general, whether they be district courts or circuit courts, have become so inured to deferring to administrative agencies that that comes as a reflex. Um, there certainly seem to be a lot of sloppy reasoning because the other thing that the Cochran on Bonk Court did is they went through the factors that are set forth by the Supreme Court in a case called Thunder Basin as to whether the uh, statutory screen scheme provides meaningful uh, judicial review, uh, whether it is within the expertise and competence of the agency, and also um, the third, third factor is... Um, Gosh, I, I argue this so many times. I'm, I'm forgetting as it's for judicial review. Uh, oh, whether it's a wholly collateral issue, okay? And and one of the very frustrating things, if you read those five circuit opinions, is they go through and say, "Well, this kind of looks collateral, but nonetheless, we're going to say the the SEC can rule on it on the first place." And then they would say, "Well, yeah, it's generally true that constitutional questions are not decided in administrative agencies." Nonetheless, maybe they could bring their expertise to bear and then moot the question out. A particularly frustrating argument when you consider that the judge mooting out whether he or she is qualified to hear the case in the first place is ruling on their own competence. Um, and, uh, and it's not meaningful judicial review. So all three of those factors were very thoroughly thought through and um, uh, well-reasoned and well-decided by the uh, panel major or rather the um, 
en banc majority in Cochran. So it was uh, for us really um, revolutionary is the way I would describe it, or at least in terms of it turned the ship around. There was a ship sailing down five to six circuits going in the wrong direction, and they they righted that course. The um, majority, uh, there are a couple of aspects of the majority opinion that I'd also like to point out, um, and this uh, this goes to anyone listening who might be handling a question of this nature, and um, that would be the uh, the use of amicus briefs. One of the things that we are very indebted to here at NCLA is uh, a wonderful set of amicus briefs that were filed in this and some similar cases on behalf of Ray Lucia. Um, as um, the majority opinion points out, Texas Public Policy Foundation filed a great amicus that talked about this issue of a judge's ability to rule on their own qualifications. And generally, a judge would be recused from such a decision. And this was interesting for us to watch because we actually saw in a number of administrative decisions, one in the um, DEA, um, Drug Enforcement Administration administrative proceedings, one of the ALJs there said, I can't rule on my own removal. And, and the ALJ himself said, you know, this is not within my power to do. Uh, but mo unfortunately, most of the administrative law judges and, and certainly the ones in both Ray Lucia and Michelle Cochran's case did feel they had the uh, capacity to rule that they were qualified to rule um, constitutionally, and they did so. So it was great to get that help at the circuit uh, and, and, and in the en banc from these um, very well done amicus briefs. Um, I would be remiss if I did not talk about the concurrence. The concurrence really is um, uh, unusual. <laughs> I think to, it, would, it would be fair to say it delves very deeply into these questions. Now, mind you, it's only six judges, but it, it goes into a very scholarly review of these uh, questions, and it locates the origin of the administrative state in Section 78Y, the very provision that created this kind of administrative um, uh, review under the uh, Securities and Exchange Act, which is one of the oldest administrative law statutes. It talks about the fact that uh, that statute uh, the quote is ceded lawmaking to bureaucracy. Um, in the panel description, we included some other uh, quotations. I think one of them is it, it transferred power, quote, far away from the three branches of government the founders worked so hard to create, separate and balance, and as far away from democracy and universal suffrage as possible. And this has allowed administrative agencies to operate in a separate, anti-constitutional and anti-democratic space, free from pesky things like law and an increasingly diverse electorate. So um, the en banc not only secured us a majority that reversed the very erroneous course uh, of proceedings that Michelle Cochran and Ray Lucia had faced, but it, it provided a very thoughtful dissent by six of the judges of the Fifth Circuit that we believe will be um, something that courts in the future will look to and learn from. At least we hope uh, that is the case. The um, uh, other point I guess I would make is we, we did not only um, ask for and get this great um, amicus support, but we gathered together a lot of um, materials such as SEC commissioners themselves talking about how these proceedings are of concern. Commissioner Hester Peirce uh, was greatly concerned about um, uh, aspects of these uh, proceedings. So it, um, I guess the lesson there is that we need to, in um, preparing and winning one of these cases, you need to think as creatively as you can. Um, if you've got five circuits against you, you need to uh, <laughs> do some hard thinking about lining up as much support as you can get. Uh, I think that's generally 
all I have to say. Uh, Greg, do you want to step in and, and offer your thoughts on the process? Sure. Um, that was a great summary, Peggy, and, and thanks. You know, I thought what I would say a little bit about is where things stand now in the Supreme Court, because as many of you know, it, 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 you know, as we are celebrating the Cochrane win, which was phenomenal, the Supreme Court has just agreed to hear this issue likely in the, in the next term. So it's interesting how those events intersect and it's no uh, coincidence. I think, you know, many of us have thought about the, the challenges and dangers of the administrative state. I'll have to say, you know, having worked on one of these cases, um, you know, these cases are really unique in terms of the impact. And Peggy alluded to this the, the, on the individuals themselves. And, you know, one thing that we, we said in, in our um, cert papers in the Gibson case was that the administrative state can be ruthless in its ability to destroy the lives of those swept up in its machinery before any wrongdoing is even established. And, you know, we haven't, Peggy sort of alluded to the, the facts in these cases, but it really is remarkable that um, courts allowed this to go on as, as long as they did before the Fifth Circuit on Bonk eventually stepped in. But, you know, thinking about how this issue got to the Supreme Court and how where we got um, we got to where things stand today. I mean, I think it's really sort of a, a lesson in perseverance and the, the, the great work that that NCLA does and many of the groups and probably individuals who are tuned in today do. Um, from 2015 to 2021, um, there were seven circuits by our count who uh, which rejected this theory and held that the administrative review provisions stripped district courts of their jurisdiction to entertain structural constitutional challenges to administrative decision makers. The, the Second Circuit, Fourth Circuit, Seventh Circuit, Ninth Circuit, Eleventh Circuit, DC Circuit, and Fifth Circuit, at least initially in the panel decision. Um, during this time, the Supreme Court denied cert in three instances, uh, in Beba versus SEC in 2016, and Beba was really sort of the first case that kicked this off, in Tilton versus SEC in 2017 out of the Second Circuit, and in Gibson versus SEC in, in 2021 out of the 11th Circuit. And each time the government was able to come in and say, um, well, there was no circuit conflict, so Supreme Court, you don't need to step in. And this was, you know, in, in my view, really one of those instances where the Supreme Court probably could have stepped in, but it didn't, and it ordinarily doesn't, as you know, when there is no circuit conflict. Um, but challengers kept bringing these claims and, you know, along the way they helped up, they, they picked up some helpful dissenting opinions. Judge Shroney in the Tilden case in the second circuit wrote the first and, you know, extremely persuasive dissenting opinion that Peggy alluded to. Judge Bumate in the ninth circuit in the Axon Enterprises case wrote a very persuasive dissenting opinion. And then Judge Haynes did in the fifth circuit in the panel decision in Cochran, which, you know, ultimately prompted the full Fifth Circuit to take it up. And then Peggy and Nancy LA convinced the Fifth Circuit to rehear the Cochrane case on Bonk and eventually convinced it to go its way, which created a circuit conflict. And lo and behold, um, in fortuitous timing, Axon's case, which the Ninth Circuit had rejected, was pending on the pending before the court on cert. And so the court granted certiorari in the case uh, January 24th, just a couple of weeks ago. So the Supreme Court, it's that case is likely to be argued next term, really next term, but the Supreme Court now will take up the issue. And one will hope, one hopes will follow uh, the Fifth Circuit's decision on Bonk and the Concord case and not the prior circuit decisions. So just to say um, a, a few words on the Action Enterprises case, which the court is now going to hear. Action case is slightly different in that it, one, it involves a company as opposed to an individual like all the other cases. And two, it comes up in the context of an administrative proceeding involving the FTC instead of the SCC, SEC. Although, as, as the government has pointed out, that the administrative review schemes are functionally equivalent. So uh, certainly the expectation is the court's resolution of this issue as to the FC, FTC administrative scheme will uh, resolve it as to the SCC scheme um, too. 
So in Axon, Axon is a company which makes body worn cameras and it acquired a competitor, um, which prompted an investigation by the FTC as to the anti-competitive effects of that acquisition. The, the FTC eventually threatened to initiate administrative proceedings in which it not only would uh, reverse the acquisition, but actually enable the competitor to use Axon's uh, intellectual property in its own manufacturing. Uh, Axon wasn't too pleased about that. It filed suit in district court, uh, asserting, among other things, that the FTC ALJs who would consider this proceeding um, were constitutionally deficient because they were protected by dual layers of uh, for-cause removal. Um, the FTC then immediately initiated administrative proceedings and, and no doubt hoped that it could keep the case before the administrative uh, agency for a long time. Um, but the district court, uh, Exxon then went to district court and brought, brought a claim, the constitutional claim. The district court dismissed their claim for lack of jurisdiction following the circuit precedent holding that the administrative review provision stripped jurisdiction over these constitutional claims. Uh, Axon appealed to the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit, in a two-to-one decision, upheld the district court's decision with Judge Bumatai dissenting. And then Axon filed a cert petition, which raised not only the, the jurisdictional question of whether the district courts had jurisdiction to entertain the stru structural constitutional challenge to the administrative decision maker, but also the merits question regarding the constitutionality of FTC ALJs. Uh, as the SEC, as the SEC have done, and the government, and the SG's office had done, in all the other cases, they initially argued that the court should deny cert because there was no circuit conflict. But then, uh, as we know now, that the Cochrane came along and created a circuit conflict. At which point, uh, Action filed a supplemental brief telling the court that this was uh, now absolutely necessary for the court to grant review in light of the circuit conflict. And the government, I think, didn't even respond to that brief leading the court to uh, grant cert. So uh, the Supreme Court will decide this issue. One hopes that it will decide, decide it favorably to the challengers and in line with the Cochrane decision. In terms of what happens next in the Cochrane case, it's likely that the, the uh, SG's office will file what's known as a hold petition asking the court to hold the Cochrane case pending the disposition in Axon Enterprises and dispose of it in accordance with the decision in that case. I think you're on mute, Peggy. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> do we, uh, we have a question about what do you think the consequences of winning looks like from our perspective? And I think winning is that um, administrative law judges cannot have more than one layer of removal protection. Um, and of course, Humphrey's executor is always an issue. Uh, and uh, they're, a true win would be to um, have the Supreme Court take a look at that doctrine as well, because what the uh, very comprehensive concurrence tells us is that we have drifted so far away from the original design of the Constitution that most of our laws are really regulations uh, that govern the lives of Americans. And they do so in a way that is very um, opaque non-transparent, and most importantly, uh, unaccountable to Americans. And so um, administrative adjudication is one of those um, ways. It is uh, a system uh, that is full of due process concerns. Uh, I know that at the time we started representing Ray Lucia, and, and Michelle uh, Cochran, there were Wall Street Journal and New York Times articles that talked about, for example, an administrative law judge who had been admonished by um, the chief judge for not being sufficiently loyal to the SEC in her decisions. Um, others, such as Cameron Elliott, um, you know, openly admitted that he always rules in, the fa in favor of the commission and uh, imposes maximum penalties on anyone with the temerity to dispute their charges. Those are deeply concerning uh, statements. Um, actually, it's very interesting that uh, Cameron Elliott, not long after the Lucia decision was um, decided, uh, transferred to a different administrative agency. I don't know if he was 
being too honest about the process for the SEC's comfort <laughs> or, or what precipitated his transfer, but um, at least SEC um, respondents no longer have to deal with a judge who, who made statements that would be deeply disqualifying and troubling if they came from a district judge. And so I think uh, a win from our perspective would be taking a look at whether administrative law adjudication is even working. Uh, with these built-in structural biases, uh, uh, another judge in some of the New York Times um, and um, Wall Street Journal reporting admitted that, you know, frankly, the SEC shifts the burden. When you're hauled before an SEC um, ALJ, the burden is no longer on the government. It's on you to show why they don't have a case against you. And you have to remember they've had months, if not years, of investigation to gather documents. They then dump those documents on you at the beginning of proceedings. You have a very short time to respond. Another good example of how bad those proceedings can get, you know, Ray Lucia had witnesses, customers, who wanted to speak on his behalf. Um, and this all came you know, out in the briefing before his first case in the Supreme Court. And just very shortly before those witnesses were to testify, the SEC served them with subpoenas requiring them to produce all of their financial records over the course of the last five years uh, before they uh, could testify in his favor. Uh, and so, of course, uh, Ray not wanting to put his his customers at that sort of peril when all they were going to testify and say was that he had never misled them or anyone else or no and no one had suffered losses uh, from the conduct that he was being charged with. And, and so he didn't even get to present witnesses on his own behalf. That would not be tolerated in the district court. So from my um, perspective, I think a win is uh, a judicial and and also social um, and cultural uh, review of things like administrative law judging and whether that is in fact how we want to be uh, prosecuted by our government in a uh, in a government that separates powers, judicial, executive, and um, legislative. Um, also, you know this. We, we are ruled by things like guidance, uh, which is just not, um, you know, part of any lawmaking. So uh, I think a, a fresh look at all of these administrative proceedings and administrative power would be a win. OK, so Peggy, I think someone asked, you know, why do you think it took so long for the courts to get this straight? And that, that's a great question, because this is kind of a you look back on how long it took to get to where we are today. and and a little bit sobering. I'm going to hope the courts would have gotten there quicker. I mean, I guess I would point to a few factors. I mean, I think, as Peggy mentioned earlier, earlier there was a you know, a tendency to defer to administrative agencies or general complacency and understanding that administrative proceedings, you know, would, would take place first. And so perhaps courts would be less likely to intervene. I think also that the, the Thunder Basin factors that Peggy mentioned earlier may have contributed a little bit in making the inquiry more um, more uh, tenuous and, and vague than it had to have been than just, you know, starting with the statute to see if the statute actually stripped the district courts of jurisdiction over these claims, which um, it, it clearly doesn't. And then I think, you know, maybe there was a, a lack of appreciation of the, um, you know, the nature of the underlying constitutional claims and the importance of these cultural constitutional protections, which, you know, fortunately, I think the Supreme Court has, has addressed more recently in some of its decisions, including free enterprise, free enterprise prize fund. Although, as Peggy mentioned, that was in 2010, and the courts really didn't pick up on it at all in a in a majority decision until the Cochrane case. As I like to say in the briefing, it's not so much that um, the courts. <laughs> didn't acknowledge uh, free enterprise fund. It's that they felt free to disagree with it. Uh, and, and that is a pretty um, astonishing thing uh, when you come to think of it, given what I used to understand as the hierarchy of judicial precedent. Let's see, I've got another question here. Um, 
uh, they, they ask uh, in the course of my, my judicial odyssey, have I encountered any Article Three judge who was aware of Philip Hamburger's work? Well, uh, the folks on the concurrence are. <laughs> and it was greatly um, gratifying to see that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a new Civil Liberties Alliance was founded by Philip Hamburger and its purpose. Uh, this was um, and we started. Um, uh, litigating and filing briefs in 2018, its purpose at its founding was to get courts to take a fresh look at all of these questions of administrative power. So the um, concurrence went deeply into that topic. I do think many judges will be educated by what they read there. Um, I certainly um, learned a few things myself in terms of the origins of um the administrative power in Section 78Y. And um, I think its re recitation of the incursions uh, and encroachments upon our civil liberties that can be done by administrative agencies, even when they seem like they're not, not necessarily a big thing at the time, they add up uh, to the denial of our civil liberties. And those are not supposed to be subject to a bureaucratic extinction. And um, I think that it's ex extremely gratifying to see the concurrence think through those issues and acknowledge in, in how they have changed the way that Americans are governed. So I hope to see more of that. I'm trying to look at my screen on these questions. One second here. Okay. Uh, someone asked whether final agency action was a problem for us. And yes, that was definitely a problem. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> it was actually comical. Uh, the briefing, the, the, the um, SEC would come in and say, well, you know, you're acting as if this is final agency action and it isn't. And therefore you can't, you know, challenge this. And, and we were like, we, we know this is not final agency action. <laughs> We are not claiming it's final agency action. We are claiming that it is not covered by these proceedings. The, 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 I mean, the, the circuit court review is for the outcome of an, a lawful administrative proceeding. And it, the um, circularity of some of the briefing was, um, well, I, w I can't really say comical, although at times that was perhaps the healthiest way for me to look at it. But it was it was frustrating. It was like we were talking past each other and um, we never made a claim. It was it was final agency action. Of course, we hadn't. I mean, <laughs> you know, the uh, Michelle hadn't uh, she, she was hadn't gone through her proceeding. We sought a stay pending review. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the SEC meant by those ar uh, arguments, but they were, um, we had wasted a lot of time and paper on them and I don't think they were well-founded. But I also think the SEC was quite used to just kind of throwing that term out and winning. Um, I mean, there's a reason why people brief uh, cases the way they do. And I think it probably had for far too long been a very successful successful strategy for them. Uh, let me see. Someone has asked about international arbitrations, and I would like to say I know the answer to that, but I don't. Um, but um, I guess I would say, here's the question, is, is an ALJ ruling on the court's competence without judicial review really a problem? Don't we do the same with the international arbitrations? And I guess what I would say is arbitrations really are a different world. Typically, there's a contractual agreement to be bound by uh, arbitrations, or there is some provision of international law that's really not um, comparable to our um, domestic separation of powers and how we how we allow the government to prosecute Americans. So, um, you know, many things happen in arbitrations. I have done arbitrations, and I've actually litigated about arbitrations, and my my concern about our arbitrations, frankly, is uh, I used to say arbitration is where all great crimes go to die <laughs> because um, arbitration uh, decisions are virtually unreviewable, at least um, in, in, in some contexts. And I find that, uh, uh, you know, 
troubling. Now, mind you, if you've agreed to this contractually, it's fine. You get your dispute resolved and you don't have the same appellate rights. But I think when the government is prosecuting a respondent, uh, none of those um, protections, uh, due process and appellate protection, should ever be surrendered uh, by people charged by the government. Okay, then someone asked about the implications for state regulatory actions in which the adjudicator is less independent than those in federal agencies. Uh, here's what little I know about state ALJs. In fact, several states, in fact, have a separate administrative law judging uh, process. And those judges are not employed by the agency that is prosecuting you. And so, in fact, I would say they're more independent in, in those states. I still think it's a problem. I think that um, the people who founded this country, whether it be through a state uh, constitution or a federal uh, constitution put the adjudicative power in its own branch. Um, I'm not at all convinced that there are not enough judges to to decide those disputes. Um, and uh, so whether they're less or more independent, I think they're just not they're not in a separated branch. And I think that has inherent problems, uh, whether it be under a state system or a federal system. Let's see. Try to see if we've got any additional questions in. Thank you. There's one question about what would you do if you had one of these cases or issues pending now? And, you know, I think certainly I would alert the court to the Supreme Court's grant of cert and, you know, possibly ask for a stay, although I think a lot of courts would be reluctant to do that for a year or more as can take the court to decide the issue. But um uh, that, that's what I would do. I agree. And, you know, I'd have plenty of briefing already uh, ready at the ready in terms of, uh, you know, starting a process that, you know, in Michelle's case was five years and um, in uh, Ray's eight years. Uh, you know, I think waiting a year for the Supreme Court to decide whether the process is constitutional in the first place is actually the more efficient way to reach the question. Um, and so I absolutely would uh, do as Greg suggested. Uh, and I think we'd have a lot of, um, you know, factual support for that. I think we've discussed the questions um, that have shown up here. Let me go to the chat function. I'm not sure I got all of those. Okay, on the day, there was a data question about how you get data about processing time for cases. Uh, and that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked it because it was super easy for us to get that data on in federal courts because the courts have to report to the judicial conference on times of average time of resolution from filing to resolution of cases. So you can go to any, uh, any court and, and do that. I think there's no accounting um, in, that I'm aware of, of administrative law judges. Um, one of the uh, most frustrating uh, aspects of, of, of this work, and I, and I did not work in administrative law before I came here, so I've had my eyes opened as to many things. One of them is that the, they have magic deadlines. I'm not kidding you here. They have magic deadlines in um, in SEC proceedings. And even though there's a rule that says that the judge has to rule within a certain number of days, and it's quite a long period of time, I think it's close to a year, 300 and some days, they have to issue uh, a, uh, a decision and a ruling. They routinely extend their own deadlines. But <laughs> God help you, if you as a respondent miss a deadline, you're caught you know, in, in these proceedings. So we like to call them magic deadlines to keep ourselves um, sane and, and, and our sense of humor going. But again, that's a, a perfect example of the asymmetry. Um, you know, a, a, an Article Three judge that's sitting on a case and the prosecution has a deadline, it's going to generally hold them to it. Same thing to a defendant. Um, but when you have the ALJ extending his uh, his own deadline to file an appeal. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's the kind of thing that. Well, let me just put it this way. When I started this work, one someone once said to me, 
you will find yourself using the word Kafkaesque a lot. <laughs> and I mean, the perfect example is poor Ray Lucia, you know, who who goes through six six years of proceedings, wins, and his prize is to go back and do it all over again. And the SEC says, C says, no, you've got to go through the whole thing on removal. And guess what? If he does and he wins, then he still has to go back <laughs> and do it a third time. No rational system of justice would ever be designed in that fashion. We kept arguing that. We kept saying that. We kept losing. <laughs> and finally, this uh, en banc uh, court heard. And um, it was extremely gratifying. We knew we were right. We knew we had logic on our side. We knew we had the statutory text on our side. We knew we had, you know, fundamental concepts of just efficiency and, and fairness in how you would design a system. And we knew we had all of those things on our side, but we lost and we lost and we kept losing. <laughs> and it was um, a very long uh, journey to this um, very satisfying um, creation of a circuit split uh, that means that the Supreme Court will address the question. Um, I don't know who, uh, well, someone has asked, who is the largest user of ALJs from an agency perspective? Uh, the, uh, the Social Security is, obviously, um, there um, are a number of such judges. Uh, one of the things that we're far less concerned about administrative power used in Social Security or, say, veterans benefits cases, because that is not someone who's been hauled before the court by the government. There's someone going before a tribunal and saying, I, I would need a ben benefit. And the ALJs there are, are making the decision, are you qualified for this benefit? So the same due process concerns are not um, as starkly at stake in those proceedings. If you take the entire number of administrative law judges, and then you ask uh, how many of those judges are in contested government prosecutions, it's an astonishingly small number. I think it hovers somewhere around 200, maybe 250. Uh, Philip Hamburger, uh, and I agree with him, thinks uh, we do just fine if we added another 250 um, federal judges to the Article Three bench and had, had them decide those cases. Um, uh, for for one thing, uh, as as the evidence that we submitted to the Fifth Circuit shows, they would be decided more efficiently. Uh, they would not take, you know, anywhere between five and 10 years uh, to be decided. So um, if you if you separate out the large number of benefits uh, ALJs who are really doing a different job, um, and, and then look at the number of ALJs who are deciding contested cases that the government has brought against Americans. Uh, it's, it's, to me, an easy call that we should go back to Article 3 judging. Okay, someone asked about how would they extend a deadline? They just do it. They issued an order saying, you know, I'm extending my deadline to issue my opinion. Uh, it's, it's not even subtle, um, even though the rules require judges to Admit, you know, issue their ruling with a, when a, within a certain time period. Um, I don't see a question yet that we haven't answered. Um, there's some nice comments. Thank you for those. But I think we've answered any of those. Greg, do you have anything you'd like to sort of wind up with? I don't. I mean, you know, I was, uh, as you were efficiently going through those questions i was looking at the the sign behind you behind you that says never 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 give up and that's as good of a motto as any for what you've done and accomplished <laughs> it's it's it is it's actually what uh winston churchill said and it's a it, it's a motto very dear to my heart <laughs> thank you both on behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank our experts for the benefit of their valuable time and expertise today. And I want to thank our audience for joining and participating. We also welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. 
As always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming teleforum calls and virtual events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. Thank you for listening to this episode of Teleform, a podcast of the Federalist Society's practice groups. For more information about the Federalist Society, the practice groups, and to become a Federalist Society member, please visit our website at fedsoc.org.